Joe DiMaggio stands ready on his home turf. Behind his poised face, his mind races. Not from the pressure of playing in the 1951 World Series. Been there, done that, won eight. But because he knows the end of the road is drawing near. Just a few paces to his left is a 19-year-old rookie named Mickey Mantle playing in his first World Series. The Giants' Willie Mays lofts a high fly ball to right center field. Mantle sprints full speed to record the out. DiMaggio's declining athleticism had no effect on his pride, and there was no chance he would let some kid infringe on his territory. I got it, DiMaggio calls out, sailing under the ball with Mantle, stopping short, catches his cleat on a drain pipe tearing up his right knee and collapsing to the ground. It became the most consequential knee injury in baseball history, not because of what was, but because of what could have been. The start of the classic hero's journey is marked by a symbolic shift, the departure of the mentor and the arrival of the hero to take their place. Whether the mentor dies, like Obi-Wan Kenobi in Star Wars, or simply passes on their knowledge to the hero and rides into the sunset. We see it play out in reality all the time. The important thing that makes this classic story a universal truth is the willingness of the mentor to make room for the hero. For Joe DiMaggio and Mickey Mantle, that wasn't the case. Instead, their crossover sparked a classical struggle of nearly biblical proportions. Two foils pitted against one another by cosmic forces, each among the most dominant players of their era, yet diametrically opposed in demeanor and style. For DiMaggio, Mantle's simultaneous failure to live up to his perceived potential and his overshadowing of DiMaggio would never be forgiven. That sole season of overlap between the two legends would prove to be a preview of years to come, giving birth to a tense relationship as the Yankees' torch was passed from one to the next. DiMaggio's pride never wavered. He did everything right. Yet even the great DiMaggio couldn't hold the public's attention as he aged out of his youth. After DiMaggio's 1999 death, Paul Simon wrote an obituary for the fallen Yankee in the New York Times. The artist wouldn't have been a natural choice to eulogize DiMaggio if it wasn't for the lyrics he wrote in his song, Mrs. Robinson. Where have you gone, Joe DiMaggio? A nation turns its lonely eyes to you. According to Simon, DiMaggio was supposedly offended by the lyric and had even considered a lawsuit. What I don't understand, he said, is why you ask where I've gone. I just did a Mr. Coffee commercial. I'm a spokesman for the Bowery Savings Bank, and I haven't gone anywhere. But it wasn't in his DNA to accept or even understand the possibility that he could evolve into a Joe DiMaggio that was no longer at the center of culture. No wonder he interpreted Simon's lyrics as a hostile attack on his reputation which he was fundamentally unable to comprehend, had entered a decline. In 1941, in the midst of DiMaggio's record-setting 56-game hitting streak, the Washington Post wrote, There is something about it, at bat and in the field, that suggests some of the great sculptures of the Italian Renaissance, Donatello's, for example. This dignity came to epitomize what it meant to wear the Yankees' pinstripes. That 56-game hitting streak is considered one of the most unbreakable record in sports, a mark of consistency, focus, and commitment that would define his career and color his disdain for the comparably low level of seriousness with which Mantle played the game. Unlike many of history's most esteemed athletes, who only had their heroics recognized after the prime of their careers, DiMaggio's aura was always apparent to his peers, fans, and to the media. To Simon, DiMaggio represented the values of the America of the 50s and 60s, a time when, quote, it was fashionable to refer to baseball as a metaphor for America. He was the antithesis of the iconoclastic, mind-bending, authority-defying 60s, which is why I think he suspected a hidden meaning in my lyrics. After Mantle arrived in 1951, DiMaggio would decide to retire, relinquishing his center field role to the young up-and-comer, despite his disapproval. The days of the clean and untarnished image of the leading Yankee star would come to a sudden and jarring end jolting into a new era that would match the shifting ideals of the new generation. The clean-cut and soft-spoken hero of the post-war era would make way for a brash, hard-partying, and big-swinging character of less certain moral clarity. By the time Mickey Mantle arrived for Yankee spring training in 1951 at the age of 19, he had already become the stuff of legend. Scouts whispered stories of his time playing Class C ball on Joplin. As if the media pressure wasn't enough, 
Mantle was saddled with the ultimate responsibility by Pete Sheehy, the Yankees' longtime clubhouse attendant in charge of distributing uniforms, who'd witnessed the sequential greatness of Babe Ruth, number three, Lou Gehrig, number four, and Joe DiMaggio, number five. Now, he would entrust Mickey Mantle with number six. But Mantle struggled his rookie season, settling into a devastating hitting slump and finding himself back in the minors, thinking about quitting the game of baseball altogether. Six weeks later, he returned and pulled his act together, batting 284 for the remainder of the season. He would always bear a mark of his initial shortcomings though, having his number six stripped in favor of the far less glamorous number seven. But at the end of that first season, he found himself in the outfield during the World Series. And seconds later, he suffered a career-changing injury. After he was carried off the field in a stretcher with the sprained knee that would sideline him the remainder of the 51 World Series, time stood still for Mickey, as well as his father Mutt, who was waiting in the dugout. The father and son would check into Lennox Hill Hospital to survey the damage. Assisting Mickey as he struggled to walk, Mutt bore the physical weight of his protege's injury. But Mutt couldn't muster the strength to support Mickey's large frame, falling to the sidewalk. Mutt had been battling Hodgkin's lymphoma for months, never telling his son, and he would die the following May. The untimely deaths of Mickey's grandfather, two uncles, and now his father seeded the idea of a mantle curse that would become a self-destructive life philosophy for the player. Growing up in the small town of Commerce, Oklahoma, both Mickey's father and grandfather were hardworking miners, but always made time to hone Mickey's skills. Most importantly, they trained him to be a switch hitter from an early age, a regiment that was made far easier thanks to Mutt's left-handed pitching and Mickey's grandfather's right-handedness. After the infamous 1951 World Series injury, it's been said Mick never played another pain-free game for the rest of his career. The slew of injuries to follow not only deprived Mantle of his blazing speed, which once clocked him at 3.1 seconds from home plate to first, a mark which, if true, would make him the fastest player in MLB history. But it also helped to foment his alcoholism, which began after Mutt's death and would continue for the rest of his life. Mickey'd reflect on the words of Stangle, who said he was going to be better than the great DiMaggio, and even Ruth, then remember the hopes of his father, lamenting how he failed him. It didn't happen. I never fulfilled what my dad had wanted. And I should have. In a 1994 article in Sports Illustrated titled Time in a Bottle, Mantle faced his addiction head on. His drinking had accelerated in the last couple decades of his life after the terminal diagnosis of his 19-year-old son, Billy, who eventually died of Hodgkin's lymphoma, yet another example of the Mantle curse. In the Sports Illustrated piece, Mickey describes seeking treatment at the Betty Ford Center. I feel more important as Mickey Mantle now than I did when I was playing for the Yankees. I was told that I got more letters of Betty Ford than anyone else in its history, and 80% of them said things like, you're in the biggest game of your life, and we want to see you win again. Mickey's sobriety came too late, it seems, as he would die in August 1995 of cirrhosis of the liver, among other alcohol-related causes. Just a month prior, in a press conference aimed at the nation's children, Mickey delivered a final, devastating message. Don't be like me. God gave me a body and the ability to play baseball. I had everything, and I just... The two Hall of Famers were foils in every way, to the pristine public image of DiMaggio and the reputation as a mostly lovable troublemaker cultivated by Mantle. DiMaggio was an Italian kid from the West Coast, Mantle an Oklahoma boy with a million dollar smile. DiMaggio, a paragon of consistency and fundamentals. Mantle, a one in a million specimen who claimed to be bred to play baseball. It was DiMaggio's view that Mantle had tarnished the Yankees name. He never took kindly to Mantle replacing him, and for his hard partying lifestyle that directly contradicted DiMaggio's advice on how a ball player should behave. Though not blameless, Mantle always maintained a baseline respect for his predecessor. He once said, Heroes are people who are all good with no bad in them. That's the way I always saw Joe DiMaggio. He was beyond question one of the greatest players of the century. In 1995, as Mantle began to succumb to liver cancer, DiMaggio still held on to his decades-long animosity. DiMaggio would later tell his biographer, You know, Doc, I don't really feel sorry for the guy. He did it to himself. <laughs>